Um, please can I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Cabinet Committee for Regeneration on Tuesday the 7th of February from the Walton Suite in the Winchester Guildhall. The time is 10 a.m. Uh, my name is Martin, Councillor Martin Todd, Chairperson of the Cabinet and Cabinet Member for Asset Management. This meeting is live streamed from the Council's YouTube channel and the recording will also be available after the meeting. Subtitles can be switched on and advice on how to turn these on is set out on our website. If you are joining us online, uh, please turn your camera and microphone off. Uh, please can everyone assure that, uh, make sure that the mobile phones are on silent. Um, can I remind members to use their microphones and speak directly into them? Um, please do not went, turn away when speaking to enable your comments to be picked up in the recording of the meeting. In the unlikely event that it is necessary to evacuate the building, the fire alarm will sound. Please follow all the instructions given to you by our team. Um, can I also welcome members of the public to the meeting this morning? Uh, when we get to public participation uh, in the agenda, if you would like to come forward to the empty desk in front of you, the microphone is activated by pressing the large button on the base. And as you know, you will have three minutes to make your contribution. A timer will appear on the screen to show the time remaining. Um, so the first item of business is apologies for absence. Um, I have apologies from um, Councillor Cunningham and Councillor Godfrey. Um, since they are the, they were the, due to be the uh, only um, opposition attendees at this meeting, I've asked Councillor Horrell to come forward and join the meeting so that um, we have the chance for her group's views to be heard um, during the course of the meeting, um, which I believe I'm allowed to do under the standing orders. Um, uh, do we have any other apologies? No, thank you, Chairman. Um, any disclosures of interest? Um, I will make my normal declaration um, that I am a county councillor and since there are highways and other issues involved, I have a personal but non-pecuniary interest. Does anybody else uh, at the meeting? No? Um, I did have a request from Councillor Horrell to speak on agenda item eight, but since she will be in the meeting, uh, she will be able to participate uh, on that basis rather than needing it to be handled as a separate deputation. I have three names listed for public participation. Um, Ian Tate, uh, Frank Devoy and Richard Baker. Um, are you wishing to speak to a specific agenda item or are you seeking to make comments in general? Um, Mr Tate. OK, and Mr Devoy. OK, so um, we'll count you at the beginning then. And uh, Mr Baker. General comments. Right. Um, in that case, I will ask uh, Mr Tate to come forward um, and make his deputation. Uh, th thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to address this committee today, and I want to speak about the Central Winchester Regeneration proposals. What is depressing for me is that when I started to prepare my comments, I referred back to your meeting of the 22nd of December 2021 and realised I addressed the committee then, and I'm going to say pretty much the same as I said then. The thrust of my remarks then were about the lack of progress made since the proposals for Silver Hill were derailed back in 2015. I asked Cabinet to seriously consider bringing forward a planning application for the Friarsgate surgery site to deliver housing scheme 
in conjunction with St John's Winchester Charity, who are the adjoining landowner. And although they haven't endorsed my remarks, they are aware and I think generally think they're worth pursuing. Yes, there are proposals to demolish the sur surgery, but there's no specific plan as to what to do with that. And my concerns are the longer it goes without a specific planning application, the greater the danger there is of the site disintegrating. I am asked repeatedly by people in Winchester and also further afield, when will the central Winchester regeneration take place? I have read through today's papers and I've also spent some time on the council's regeneration page, but unless I'm missing something, there is no clear indication of when something constructive, i.e. will be built in the central Winchester area. We are now seeing planning applications coming forward for, for key sites surrounding the central Winchester regeneration area, most notably the RAOB building, 149 and 150 High Street, there are also serious rumours that a hotel is proposed for the old St Clement's surgery. I have no issues with, with, with the proposal, but it, it, and so unless the council acts speedily, could the redevelopment of this area be taken out of the council's hands by piecemeal planning applicants? Now that the Brook Centre has new owners, who I feel are determined to enhance not only their asset, but the quality of the surrounding area. And, and we've seen some excellent work already undertaken by the council through the estates team to improve Kings Walk and Middle Brook Street. But I do worry there may be a lack of understanding of how a co coordinated approach be enacted. I welcome the clarity that we are seeing from the leader of the council, but the, the challenge of the central weed generation area is, is, is really pressing and, and a real challenge and I do hope that you are able as far as you can to give a clear indication of a timeline which we can buy into. Thank you very much Chair for the opportunity to address your committee. Um, as the subject's been raised I should declare a in context non-prejudicial interest as the council's appointee to St John's Winchester Charity. Um, thank you, Councillor Lerney. Um, and thank you, Mr. Tate, for your comments. You will be pleased to know that item six on the agenda um, is the includes the Central Winchester Regeneration uh, Timetable update, which I hope will provide a bit more clarity. Uh, and as that will make clear, we are moving to the stage of uh, appointing a development partner, um, which is a decision that is scheduled to be taken in March and will address, I think, um, all of the issues that you have raised. Um, in terms of the question of piecemeal planning applications, the SPD sets out a coherent view as to how the area should be developed and remains at the heart of the process, at the heart of the procurement process, uh, and at the heart of all our decision making. Um, Mr. Devoy, would you like to come forward and make your deputation? Uh, is, um, I, I'm afraid there isn't uh, the facility. If you have a question you would like to ask now, you are welcome to do so. Um, there, Is that working? Yeah, good. Um, there isn't the facility um, for uh, members of the public to ask questions in the meeting. That is reserved for the councillors present, um, unless you do so now. Um, so if you have a question you'd like to ask, feel free to ask it. Uh, if you'd like to ask separately from the meeting, I'd be very happy to answer it. But in terms of public questions, unfortunately, we have quite a defined process at the council um, and it's not possible for you to do that later in the meeting. The, the slot for public uh, speaking is is now, in essence. If you'd like to wait until uh, Mr. Baker has had his um, 
his deputation and then uh, see if a uh, question if you if you feel ready to ask a question at that point then i will absolutely do my best to answer it um, but the reactive questions later in the meeting come from councillors um mr baker would you like to come forward and make your deputation Good morning, Chairman. I'm speaking on behalf of the City of Winchester Trust. I did say my question is general, but it's a collection of specifics as well. As you mentioned, item six is on this agenda this morning is where updates are going to be given on the central area and the station approach projects. Could those updates include, and I am repeating a little bit of what Ian Tate has said, an update on the outstanding planning applications which remain unresolved in the central area and the City of Winchester movement strategy. The three planning applications I refer to are one made by the Council for the demolition of the Friars Gate Medical Centre and the redevelopment of the RAOB site in Cross Keys Passage. Both of these were submitted in August, six months ago. Third application is for 149150 High Street and the land to the rear in Silver Hill, which was submitted in November and has yet to be determined. The other issue is the City of Winchester, sorry if I confused you, right, is the City of Winchester Movement Trust. What is the timetable for consultation on a final set of detailed plans showing how the movement strategy is going to be implemented? Within the Trust are many architects and planners with a deep understanding of Winchester and its planning issues to advise that these plans need to be adopted and to be put in place before any design and planning work commences again on the central area and station approach. The resolution of issues on traffic movement, buses, parking, taxis, deliveries, pedestrian zones and routes and cycle routes that reduce traffic and extend the public realm in the city centre will provide the essential movement context for the development of these two major sites. The sequence of having an adopted movement strategy whose consultation began in autumn 2017 before progressing development of these two sites is critical. Hence the trust question, what is your, what is the timetable for resolving the movement strategy? Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you very much indeed for those questions. Um, we will be talking about, um, so within the scope of this meeting, we do not include other people's planning applications. Uh, I don't think we're we're in a position to talk about that and we don't have the right officers present. Um, I am willing to try and find out the situation, but I would stress that that relates to the council's regulatory role uh, as a planning authority and not to its executive role as a landowner and and the body that's that's looking to redevelop the center. So um, it is not a matter over which we have any executive control, although I'm happy to get clarification on it. The, the question of the demolition of the Friars Gate Medical Centre is a different one because we are the landowner in that particular case. Um, we have suspended the current planning application um, that because the context, um, um, because uh, we think there may be a better option that we will touch on, I think, later in the um, discussion about archaeology, which is to use that site. Um, well, perhaps 
Can I ask um, Mrs Lyons to say a few words about it? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, what we've done is we have asked the, the, the planning authority to uh, delay the determination of the planning application that we have in because as part of the discussions we're having around the archaeology works, which this committee is considering today, we are looking at whether there is an option to incorporate some further archaeological works within that site on the Friars Gate when we bring that building down. So we're currently exploring options for that, and then we will revisit and come back to this gen regeneration committee with more thought through and more, more detailed options because I think what we want to do is make sure that we get the, the right use for that site, bearing in mind that it is going to be a temporary use and archaeology is something that we could perhaps use to forward and de-risk the site as we go forward. So bear with us on that. We, we, we are looking at it um, and that will come back to this committee in, in the future. Thank you. Um, in terms of the City of Winchester movement strategy, the movement strategy was adopted under Councillor Horrell's administration. It is an adopted document. Um, if you are looking for a full final funded plan, then you are probably adding a 10 to 20 year delay to central Winchester regeneration on the basis that, for example, a critical element of the movement strategy is the redevelopment of M3 Junction 9. It is absolutely essential part of the movement strategy. It is the development of a large park and ride to the north of the city, an essential part of the movement strategy. Um, in practice, it is a strategy. The 10 priorities that are currently being worked on and for which funding will be sought um, are identified and underway. I know that, for example, consultation has happened with local residents for the redesign of um, the Worthy Lane Corridor, for example, um, the parking and access strategy that the City Council has implemented and updated reflects the priorities of the movement strategy. The, um, the work that is going on for the Mini Holland um, and uh, the local cycling and walking infrastructure plans reflects the priority of the, min of, of the movement strategy and indeed will be used to make funding bids to Active Travel England uh, and other sources in order to implement the movement strategy. The, it is however a strategy and it has is something that needs to change in terms of the funding context that we operate in because the County Council has no money and they are the funding body for highways and are wholly dependent on external funding in order to implement anything within the movement strategy. And so, um, uh, yeah, and so if we were to wait for a full and final plan, firstly, um, we would be waiting decades to get to the end of the process. Uh, and secondly, um, we would be um, unable to, well, we will be unable to progress anything in the meantime. Um, what we are doing is ensuring that the people working on the strategy, and it is a strategy and it is something that is designed to direct our work for years to come, um, is that they are working closely with the Central Winchester Regeneration team. And so the needs of Central Winchester Regeneration are considered within the work of the movement strategy. Um, um, and, the, and the two do work synergistically, but if your intent or belief is that there should be some final blueprint um, that would be signed off, locked in, and we would wait to be implemented, um, then that is not something that reflects the reality of local government funding for highways improvements and the reality of how the City of Winchester movement strategy is influencing and will influence movement in the city. Um, Council Lerner, you are the cabinet member responsible for the movement strategy. Is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you. Um, I was pretty much going to say um, what you said, Leader. Um, I think it's important to say that we have completed a number of feasibility studies, um, including the Mini Holland feasibility, which is in now in its uh, final stages before hopefully being sent to government uh, which potentially could throw up a considerable amount of funding. Uh, what the feasibility studies are telling us is that we are looking at many tens of millions of pounds of expenditure 
in order to implement the movement strategy. Um, so the funding behind that will inevitably be um, opportunistic, um, but we are in a really good position to access government funding because we have so much work behind us. And for example, in the Mini Holland case, the fact that we have a city council working closely with the county council has been a major factor in us even getting the funding to do the feasibility for that work. But I think there are some, um, certainly the work is throwing up some very exciting possibilities for the town um, and we will be consulting on a number of aspects of that um, in the next year. Um, thank you, Councillor Lanning. No. Time to respond? No. <laughs> um, I'm more than happy. We are more than happy to have a separate briefing with the City of Winchester Trust to explain how the movement strategy works in the context of today's world of funding and how we are using it to drive change. And yes, there is work already published within the movement strategy as to what the endpoint might look like. Um, that's already done out there, published, available for you to read should you choose to do so. Um, but in terms of being in a position to make commitments and commitments mean you've also identified the funding, um, that is something that will work in an incremental opportunistic way over time towards the end goal as previously laid out in the documents of the movement strategy. Um, but I'm I'm sure we are more than happy because I know it is an area of great interest uh, to the city, to the city of Winchester Trust um, to have a meeting with you to talk through and your members to talk through the movement strategy so that you can understand how it works and how it is already driving change within the city um, and how it will continue to do so and how it will work with the major projects regeneration. Thank you for the offer, but I don't expect. Well, um, um, Mr. Devoy, do you have a question? OK. Right. Um, on to the next item of the agenda, um, Chair's announcements. So, um, this is the first uh, meeting in recent times of the Cabinet uh, Regen Regeneration Committee. Um, and I'd just like to sort of clarify how it sits within the governance. Um, there was a decision taken last July uh, to set up this um, uh, to set up this this subcommittee and the cabinet housing subcommittee um, because it is a uh, a subcommittee of cabinet the voting members are the cabinet members you see present here today um, this is something that is a constitutional requirement as long as we're operating the leader in cabinet system However, because we want to have a wider discussion and hear um, the voices of uh, people outside Cabinet in our deliberations, uh, we have normally two representatives of the administ uh, of the um, uh, two representatives from each political group. Um, uh, two from the Liberal Democrats, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Westwood, and normally uh, two from the Conservatives, um, neither of whom could make it today, and I've asked Councillor Horrell to uh, deputise for them. The scope of this committee is to act on behalf of Cabinet uh, to ensure that the policies and objectives established by Cabinet and by full Council are met on its major redevelopment projects. Um, so it has the power to exercise financial management and procurement powers of Cabinet, to agree project plans, monitor progress of the project against that plan, to agree progression to the next stages of design as set out in the project plan, uh, to ensure effective actions are in place to manage, to address key risks, um, to consider and agree methods of consultation and engagement, to consider and agree a communication strategy, and to approve where appropriate um, the outlined strategic and full business cases. It also exercises the power of the Cabinet under the financial procedure rules in respect of each regeneration project, and it exercises the following powers of Cabinet under the contract procedure rules 
um, relating to approval of price quality evaluation criteria, shortlisting procedures and awarding contracts. Um, it also approves um, submission of any planning applications to the council um, as, as landowner. Um, is the approval happens. Obviously, the decision by the local planning authority is handled separately. Um, it it agrees land disposals to take forward the project, although there are quite tight financial limits on that and land, land acquisitions. Importantly, there are a range of thresholds which I won't go into detail now, which will mean that certain larger decisions have to be taken by cabinet or in some cases by full council. Um, and in that in that um, situation, this cabinet the committee will often meet to discuss and recommend uh, to cabinet or to full council on those issues. And it can also decide on its own account that it wishes to refer a decision to cabinet or to full council. So um, I hope that is clear in terms of where that fits in. And although we will be talking about project governance later today, this scope and the powers of this committee and the decision making role of this committee um, is not affected by that. Um, there are certain, um, well, we'll come on to that paper later. Um, so in terms of the agenda that we have in front of us today, we have three main things that um, effectively tap into the, the, uh, the, the sort of two forces at work when we think of regeneration. Um, within our city. Um, the first is protecting what is special about our city and so you will be hearing about archaeology um, and the recommendations that came forward from our archaeological advisory panel but also ensuring that we move forward into the future and the central Winchester area which needs regeneration. Um, we'll be talking about how that process is going to be managed um, in the future going forward. Um, but the first item that we need to talk about is uh, the the timetable and overall status update. And um, we have uh, Varian Lyons here who I think will take us through um, that paper, these slides rather. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and, and welcome everybody. So yeah, as, as Councillor Todd has said, we are going to give you now an update on where we are with the, the project. But it would be remiss of me to go straight into where we are at the moment without just reminding everyone of the process and the journey that we've been through to get to this stage. And I think, as, as Councillor Todd said earlier, we are on the brink of going to a cabinet um, early March to appoint our uh, development partner to help us bring forward central Winchester regeneration. But there's been an awful lot of work that's gone on prior to this. Um, we've already talked a lot this morning about the supplementary planning document. Uh, it is at the heart of everything that we're currently doing on Central Winchester. It's It had a lot of support, it still has a lot of support and we are very much taking that forward. So that was adopted back in June 2018. So a really great framework for us to work within. Um, quite flexible, a lot of, a lot of flexibility within that uh, document. And we spent quite a bit of time working up different scenarios, talking to people about what they really wanted to see out of the central Winchester site in slightly more detail, maybe than the supplementary planning document was, was stipulating. Um, so from that, in November 2020, we took the development proposals out to consultation, and that was an amalgamation of the conversations that we've had around the different scenarios and the different emphasis, um, whether it be cultural, residential, three scenarios, some of you may remember those. So we took all of those comments on board and we then went to a cabinet to approve those development proposals, and they were our proposals, the, the council's proposals as a starter for 10 about what the redevelopment could look like within central Winchester based on the SPD and the specifics that people wanted. So those development proposals were approved at Cabinet in March 2021 and approval then was also given for us to start the strategic outline case which looks at the justification and builds on the justification for developing central Winchester. We went through that process and then again completed the strategic outline case 
And in that, we looked at the ways for delivery, what success looked like, what our investment objectives were. I won't go into that in great detail here. There will be the opportunity to revisit all of those through the cabinet papers that will be coming out. And also these documents um, are available through the papers on our website. But we did complete that strategic outline case, which identified the, as I say, the investment objectives, the SPD objectives, and looked at the best way it felt for this site to be delivered. And that was through finding a development partner to work with us to get the right scheme. So, the strategic outline case was taken to cabinet on July in July 2021 for that decision to come that yes there is a case to answer and yes the strategic outline case um, recommends a development partner let's go and do further work on that so the outline business case was then approved so we started work on the outline business case and that built on all the work that we did on the strategic case. So it looked far more detail at the, uh, the commercial approach, how we would go to procure, what we would be looking for, how the, um, the, the sort of how it might work and how the scheme might be managed. So all of that information, there was some economic benefits looked at um, and all of that came through the outline business case. Again, it is available if you want to have a look on the website. Um, and that then went to the meeting, which I think Mr. Tate, you referred to, December 2021, where the outline business case was approved at Cabinet and approval was given at that point to proceed with the procurement options outlined, which was to go out and find a development partner using the competitive dialogue approach. So um, there was a recommendation then to full council so that full council could approve that that process commenced and that was given in January of 22. So from that point, and it does seem like an awfully long time, I do understand that, but there are very strict processes and protocols and regulations governing the procurement on that sort of scale. So we have been following the procurement process. The procurement process started on the 17th of March 2022 with the issuing of the um, the issuing of the um, key documents. One of those was the selection questionnaire, which looked at um, inviting interested parties to submit their interest to us. We had 13 interested parties come to us and submit those SQs. And what we then did was we shortlisted those against the criteria set out and went on to our shortlist. And since the middle of May, we have been in competitive dialogue with those shortlisted parties. We had three on that shortlist. Um, we spent several months going through the, 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 the dialogue process. We also um, did site visits. We had site visits. We went un, 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 unattended site visits by the by the preferred uh, by the bidders that our some of our cabinet members went on, and also our reference group, just to have a look at some of the sites that the three shortlisted bidders had delivered in the past. And we also got the bidders to come in and do presentations again to our reference group here at Central Winchester and members of cabinet. So they got a thorough grilling. We got to understand them. They got to understand us, which bearing in mind we are looking for a partner and not a scheme has been really important for us to both under understand them and them to understand us. So where we are currently is the submission uh, deadline was November, the beginning of December. We received those final bids and we then entered a process of evaluation of those shortlisted bids. It was an officer led evaluation with myself, uh, John East and our head of asset management, Jeff Coe. We evaluated and we had obviously our advisors in the background as well to support with that. So an officer led uh, evaluation and what we are now doing is working up to the decision that we have mentioned this morning around appointing that particular preferred bidder the one that's come out on top through the evaluation process and the date for that is the 6th of March so that is when the cabinet will consider and look to um, review the recommendations of the cabinet report 
However, before that, it will also be going to scrutiny committee on the 27th of February. So there will be the opportunity to have that looked at ahead of cabinet and for cabinet to have the benefit of the scrutiny comments as they make that decision. So the papers will be coming out for that on the 17th of March. So do look out for those. So. Subject to cabinet approval on the 6th of March, what are our next steps? There are various different elements within the contractual arrangements that we are proposing to enter into uh, in the development agreement with the partner. And the first sort of milestone is, 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 is the six month milestone. So within that, we will be looking with that appointed partner. There is a standstill period that we have to observe after the sixth of 10 days, um, but we will be making that announcement uh, before we then enter into the the, the pre-election period where we have to be uh, a little more um, careful around the communications. So there will be a week where we will announce who that preferred bidder is and who our development partner is. And we will then be working on things that you can see here on screen. We'll be working on that final communications and engagement plan, both the preferred bidder and ourselves are fully aware that it is key to getting any projects across the line to bring people with us, engage, involve and and absolutely bring people with us. So they are of, of, of the same the same opinion and it was part of the evaluation process. What is the communication strategy? So that will need to be agreed and implemented. The governance of which there is a paper coming through today, the governance will need to be set up so that we can absolutely ensure that there is proper um, monitoring and, and governance of the project. And we will also be then working with the development partner to firm up the dates around their key delivery plan. Now, the development agreement is a very complex legal document which has got very, very sort of um, firm long stop dates. I won't go into what those are at the moment, but they are the sort of the very end dates that certain key milestones can happen. Obviously, our develop the preferred development partner and ourselves want things to move fairly quickly and come forward quite quickly. So we will be agreeing that delivery plan with them and getting approval for that through um, through a cabinet uh, session within six months of appointment. We'll be finalising the legal terms and conditions and basically um, the, the, the big the big picture will be moving ahead. Also conscious, though, however, that we want to see activity uh, from day one. So we will be expecting the preferred uh, then appointed development partner to come down, start communications and engagement on the ground um, and start that meanwhile uses uh, strategy, because again, really important to continue on the work that's been done at Kings Walk, but also to, to improve and, and build on that so that we're working with our current occupiers and our current tenants so that they are again along on the journey with us, looking to um, enabling them to be part of the long term vision for Central Winchester. So that's the next immediate sort of few weeks and months appointment of the development partner in March. A six month period where we absolutely nail the delivery plan, bring that back for approval. And then the key sort of milestones after that, it's really difficult to put timings on it just at the moment. But as you're aware, we're looking for a partner. We don't have a scheme. We will be looking to work with the development partner to build up a scheme and develop the planning submission. That will be the next key milestone, which will then, of course, come back for cabinet approval before that. Um, planning submission is 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 lodged and there then will be a period of planning going through the planning process um, after which the planning has been determined we will then be uh, agreeing and working through all the various different con conditions that need to be satisfied before then the, the the first spade in the ground so we haven't got firm dates for that but within the next sort of few months, we will be tying those down a little bit more and we can bring those back to explain more when we know what they are. Um, thank you very much for your extremely comprehensive um, outline of uh, <laughs> the uh, the timeline and it's much appreciated. Um, colleagues, do you have any questions? Hello, councillors, do you have any questions, things you'd like to clarify? that is a tribute to the clarity of your explanation. Um, 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, and we have a similar update. Sorry, Caroline. Sorry, um, Council yeah, Rule. Chair, sorry. Um, yes, I was just. Um, could um, uh, Mrs. Lyons please just clarify about the planning application? Um, as the statutory body for planning, but also as the developer, clearly having clear lines uh, between the two functions is going to be important. And obviously, uh, the regeneration of this site is not a uh, a one moment project, it will go on for many years, clearly. Um, could she help us to better understand how we ensure that we get that division between uh, the two parts of the Council's work and how we might approach the overall planning application, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Lyons. Thank you, Councillor Horrell. Yes, of course, we are absolutely aware of the, 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 the different roles that we have, um, both with the regulation and obviously with us as, as, as development partners. So there are already strict sort of guidelines in a Chinese wall in place so that colleagues in the planning team that will be um, determining the planning application are not part of any conversations that are going through with us. Um, or with the proposed development partner. So we are very aware of that and we will be having separate officers and separate advisors on both sides of that of, of that Chinese wall. So we have been working to that right the way through. With regards to the type of planning application, um, the planning strategy has been outlined as because it is a very long term project, we've got the SPD, which clearly sets out the planning approach and is the is, is a material consideration. But the next step to that will be for the development partner to submit a planning application, which is a hybrid. So we have to be aware of the fact that we are in a conservation area. So there will be a hybrid application which will cover across the, the site that we're talking to our development partner in sort of an outline form. But the phase one where they want to get in, we will be expecting a detailed planning submission for that. So when they submit first, it will be an, an outline for the whole with a detailed planning application for the phase one and paying more attention to how that phase one will then link into those later phases as they come through. And that's something that our, our planning regulatory team would be comfortable with. Thank you. Um, any other questions from councillor colleagues? Um, who is in? Ah, oh, Mr. East, can you take us through the station approach equivalent? Uh, thank you, leader. <clears throat> um, members will recall that back in 2021, we were approached by uh, Network Rail and their development managers, London Continental Railways, uh, LCR for short, who are probably best known for taking for the regeneration of King's Cross uh, as to whether we wish to re-explore um, our land holdings around the station, um, uh, uh, including both our land holdings and, as importantly, the land holdings of Network Rail. Um, so we agreed a f an informal collaboration uh, with Network Rail and LCR to, to, to explore the potential opportunities, um, which we brought forward proposals in July last year to Cabinet uh, to look at uh, a further more formal exploration of the opportunities. And um, back in uh, July, um, we approved the draft development principles uh, to go out to consultation. We approved the suggested study area and um, we approved a consultation engagement strategy, um, absolutely key, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, in addition, we agreed that the Council should undertake a market value stra a study so we could understand the potential optimal and best uses um, for our sites. Parking usage and forecasting study, absolutely essential to understand the interrelationship um, between traffic movement and in particular parking uh, and the wider um, uh, parking implications uh, for the city. Uh, to inform potential release of car parks redevelopment. Um, and thirdly, a, a, the undertaking a capacity study to examine both the existing uh, conditions and constraints on the site, but also to sort of uh, look at what might be um, initiative or indicative massing, uh, the kind of scope and quantum and any development 
particularly having regard to previous schemes, uh, but also um, viability. We also agreed at that time that we will continue to explore um, opportunities with uh, uh, Network Rail and London and Continental Railways. Um, we went out to consultation on the um, draft development principles uh, last summer uh, with an extensive consultation exercise between uh, July and October. Um, we had well over a thousand uh, responses to that exercise undertaken through a variety of uh, means, both, if I can put it this way, sort of passive and very active, um, uh, including sort of setting up um, sort of uh, 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 um, pods at the station to gathering uh, commuters' experiences, speaking to a very wide range of stakeholders, uh, uh, setting up a website with um, an interactive map to enable um, stakeholders to input their comments, uh, seeking out the views of the business community, um, a, a, as well as more passive uh, sort of and traditional forms of engagement. The outcome of that um, was overwhelmingly uh, positive in terms of uh, the response to the council or the suggested draft development principles. And indeed, we will be uh, reporting uh, more formally to this committee uh, next month. Um, we've also been working, uh, we've undertaken the parking uh, study, so that is nearing completion. And we are currently uh, working on the capacity study, and we expect uh, that work to be completed next month. Um, I should also say, because we've been talking earlier about the Winchester Movement Strategy, there is an absolute sort of integral correlation between the work which we're doing in terms of looking uh, at these sites. And this is particularly a scheme, you know, the outcome is to generate, is looking at a place outcome, if I can put it that way, uh, and how we are going to improve uh, not just um, the environment uh, around uh, station approach and station, uh, the um, uh, uh, public realm is particularly important, but also how uh, the station area works in terms of movement. So we are working uh, very closely, have been working very closely with those officers who are engaged on the Winston Movement Strategy, in particular Hampshire County Council uh, officers. Um, we, um, as I said, um, expect to complete our initial work uh, during the course of uh, next month, and we will uh, uh, be then uh, starting to work during spring on the development of a strategic outline uh, uh, business case. Um, we had um, the first meeting of uh, the reference group, which we agreed, cross-party reference group, which we agreed at the cabinet last year that we would establish uh, actually um, yesterday, and we will have further meetings with them uh, during the spring uh, to give them uh, uh, views to, to see the work, uh, you know, our approach. Uh, and the developing uh, work. Um, and then our intention is to go to scrutiny committee um, in June with a report to cabinet uh, in the summer with the outcome of all this work uh, and to um, report on uh, whether there's a business case or not. And at that point in time, uh, the intention is that the cabinet will make a decision as to whether to proceed uh, to develop a master plan or not. So um, this sort of wavy line, and apologies uh, to you, particularly the audience at the back, who are probably going to struggle to, to see it, but I'll just talk you briefly through it. Um, but when I think what this says, and that red arrow is where we are, where, where we are on the journey. So we're at the start of the journey. Um, but um, we will be, um, as I said, uh, reporting um, to Cabinet uh, during the summer to make a decision uh, which will give them both uh, obviously feeding back uh, on the community uh, 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 consultation ex uh, findings, the capacity study findings, the outcome of our work on the, uh, the strategic outline business case and the decision as to whether to, get, to go to the next stage. If Cabinet do uh, make a decision to go to the next stage, the next uh, sort of the bottom of uh, the curve, one of the curves, the second curve will be during the course of the autumn. Uh, we will be procuring master planners uh, with an intention to start preparing a master plan in the spring of next year, um, at which point there will be further community and stakeholder engagement 
on the master plan process and then a, uh, a decision at Cabinet with a report back on um, the outcome of the master plan and development and delivery options and uh, uh, approval to the outline business case. So that's the bottom of the sort of third curve. Uh, uh, and then uh, on the basis that Cabinet approves the master plan, we will then during the course of spring to summer 2025 be developing the full business case um, with, um, depending on, on progress, an intention during the course of, uh, for, or from winter 2025 onwards, to start uh, the process of either submitting a planning application or identifying a development partner to prepare and submit the planning application on our behalf. So I think in conclusion, three points. Firstly, this is really at the very early stages of the, of the wider process. There's an awful long way to go and decisions to be made. Secondly, it is very much a staged process. We are going stage by stage by stage and each stage obviously reporting and securing uh, council agreement uh, as to whether to progress or not. And I think the third point, which is really important and comes back to what we've been discussing earlier, at each step of the way, we will be going out to consult and engage with our stakeholders uh, and with the wider uh, uh, Winchester audience uh, and seeking their views. So uh, this is very much as if I was going to say almost like a co-design process, um, because I think the absolute key is uh, we know what's happened in the past. We absolutely want need to make sure um, that uh, we bring our stakeholders with us on the journey. Um, but the journey will lead to an eventual uh, outcome, which is very much around improving uh, the public realm, transport movement and the environment around uh, the station. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr East. Um, do I have councillors? Do I have any questions? Um, Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. East, for that uh, comprehensive update. Um, in, in terms of where we are today, we're talking about a parking survey and so on. So we've got a base set of assumptions that we're working on. And clearly, we're, we're living in uh, an era where change is, is moving quite fast, actually. So we had COVID, it affected all the travel patterns, et cetera, and things are slowly moving to a different place. Is there provision in this plan at the latter stages to recheck our assumptions and refine our plans based on changes to those assumptions? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, and I should say that why we've already uh, undertaken and continue to undertake very extensive baseline work is because the nicest possible way life has changed, you know, since the pandemic, uh, as well as, dare I say it, economically. So, you know, things like the market study, which we undertook, was to recheck whether the kind of uses which had previously been considered by this site remained relevant. And indeed, are there new uh, uses coming forward which may be more relevant? Uh, and similarly, are there emerging trends? So, um, you know, we've been working that through. I think absolute key, were, you know, which is why we're undertaking the parking study, is are they changing parking uh, patterns post uh, the pandemic? Uh, and it goes without saying that in things, issues around movement um, uh, and why it's so important that we link this uh, study and the work we're doing to the Winston Movement uh, study is because, you know, in terms of parking and transport, how life is in Winchester now and how life will be in five, ten years is going to be very different. So that sort of plays to, I think, the point which you're making is that throughout the course of this exercise and we prepare things like the master plan, we will be continuing to recheck uh, effectively to make sure that we've got our assumptions right, because what we don't want to be doing, and this is a long term project, is that, you know, when it comes to submitting a planning application, you know, in you know, two, three, four years time, that we're making making those assumptions in terms of development of the application on how life was now, as opposed to how it will be then. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thank you, leader, and um, thank you, Mr. East, for taking us through um, the the presentation, the one the one slide. And I'm delighted to hear just how much engagement there was at the early phase um, of of this journey. Um, I just have a question. Obviously, um, station approach is an area that we have looked at other schemes for before and they've faltered. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about 
the opportunities or um, whether or not you feel having the um, the railway alongside us looking at this whole area gives greater opportunity or perhaps gives a greater opportunity for this to be a successful scheme. Thank you. So I think the first thing which I would say is that um, in, in our starting point in looking at this project was very much, dare I say, looking backwards to understand what had gone before for two reasons. One, so we're not reinventing the wheel, but also to learn from what had happened before and, and you know, why it was that uh, previous projects possibly hadn't, you know, progressed. Um, uh, I think for me, and I think for the council, the involvement of um, network rail is important because it allows us to look collectively, not just at our sites. We have, in reality, two key sites, which are one's called the Carfax site and the other one is called the Cattle Market, um, but also the sites which are in um, uh, uh, networks rails ownership. So that's the first thing. So it enables us to look at a more comprehensive area. Secondly, uh, it critically enables us to look at what I might call, and it's a very sort of generic, almost kind of cliche, but a place scheme, you know, uh, whereas I think without networks rails involvement, you would be looking at a collection of potentially individual sites and buildings, council buildings. This actually enables you us to look, I think, much more readily in terms of things like the release of car parks, what we do about car parking, bearing in mind the existing sites on um, which are owned by Network Rail are all car parks. So it enables the potential for rationalisation. It enables the potential particularly to think about the movement strategy and how that is integral to effectively, um, you know, a successful scheme. So I think those are, for, you know, I think for me, the key um, you know, opportunities. So rather than it becoming, dare I say it, not quite a property scheme, it is now very much a regeneration and place scheme. And also we'll see where we get to, but it potentially enables, you know, in terms of a sort of equalisation. So one of the things if we decide or the council decides to go into a more formal partnership with Network Rail, you know, the obvious thing would be some form of equalisation, which may mean that you can then um, have there I say it, unviable parts on different sites, but actually make a much better whole rather than considering uh, the project on a scheme by scheme basis with ever, every site having to be viable. And the danger is that you don't necessarily always get, you know, what you'd want. Thank you very much indeed, um, Mr East. Um, Councillor Edwards. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for that. Um, overview. You mentioned that the initial uh, initiation of this conversation came from outside Winchester. It came from the railway uh, railway organisations. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of the time scale and how this project would lie alongside CWR. I got a bit lost with the curves. I'm afraid, forgive me, but I did notice that you were talking about a business case potentially being agreed about four years after the CWR business case. So I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about the, the capacity of the city to direct and to remain resilient through the delivery of what could be overlapping, and I would suggest in both cases, complex and I hope ambitious developments. So again, um, very good question. I think there's two two things there. So um, as I think uh, Councillor Edward, you have um, highlighted, I mean, in reality, uh, what will happen at station approach, will use the word follow, but it will happen after um, CWR, both in terms of the evolution of a detailed scheme, if the council decides that it wishes to progress that, you know, uh, and Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so bearing in mind that um, in reality, I suspect you know um, buildings will uh, on uh, Central Winchester, you know, actually physical 
development will happen prior to um, uh, anything taking place on st station approach. But actually, it also, I think the absolute key thing is that we haven't been working on these two projects in isolation. Um, so I'm strategically uh, assisting on both projects. So it, there's absolutely a correlation between the two. And of course, that golden thread, again, dare I say, it is with reach to movement strategy. So, so we are looking at that uh, as a piece. Uh, as I think uh, Mrs. Lyons has highlighted earlier, um, we, you know, on Central Winchester, we have specifically sought a development partner that will be announced in the next month. Um, so in terms of capacity on Central Winchester, one of the reasons for seeking a development partner was around both mitigating risk to the council, but also bringing in those additional resources and expertise. Similarly, um, the uh, in terms of station approach, one of the reasons I think for us informally wanting to work with um, network rail and you know it'll be decision as to both parties as we want to enter into a formal collaboration moving forward but is around both sharing risk but also importantly uh, enabling that additional capacity because what London Continental Railways bring with them who are effectively uh, the uh, network rails development you know managers you know development consultants is significant expertise um, and um, a, 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 and additional capacity which we would share in as a council. So to that extent, um, that means that the load on the council in delivering both projects would not be as the same as if we were to do it ourselves. Now, of course, at that point in time, if members make a decision as to whether they wish to progress, they will um, you know, you know, need to make a judgment on, on council resources. Um, but what I would say is, do I feel confident that the council can undertake, if the conditions are right for you know, basically progressing development, can they undertake the both projects together? Uh, yes, I think they can, but I think that's going to be one of the judgments which the council will need to make you know, uh, uh, moving forward. And at this stage, you know, the issues for us in terms of particularly station approach is, is there a basis, you know, a, you know how can it, a good rational strategic outline business case to move forward? Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. East, for the presentation. Um, I think it's great to actually have the opportunity to share this with um, uh, you know, wider, uh, wider group and, and members of the public. Um, my question was all, also all around the timeline and the involvement of LCR, which I think is an extremely exciting proposition, actually, um, should everything <laughs> um, go to plan. But um, you don't say any, any, anywhere in that timeline where we would have to take that decision about whether to go into a formal sort of partnership, if you like, with LCR and how that might work. So I just wondered whether you might say a few words about that. Thank you. So I think um, the uh, council would need to make, or they will need to make a decision, you know, in the summer when it goes to cabinet. They'll be making a decision, I think, on two fronts, which is one, whether to progress, pr progress um, the project or not. And, you know, um, depending on the outcome of the current work, which we are undertaking on uh, you know, capacity and viability, you know, um, it's possible that, you know, we may all say that despite our very best efforts, now is not the right time to, to progress, you know, a scheme. You know, that, that is a, you know, an outcome as well as one which we do progress a scheme. If the council feels it is right and appropriate and the opportunities are such that it's you know, to go to the next stage, then I think we would at that time be suggesting that the council then enters into a more uh, formal collaboration. Um, but of course, I come back to the point I've made, it is a step by step process. And beyond that, collectively, depending on where we get to, the council will need to undertake a similar option optioning exercise to the one which we did for Central Winchester, which is to decide what is the best route and way of taking forward development which could be anything from not saying that we would do, the council directly undertaking development through to a JV, through to seeking a development partner 
and and or selling sites and all all measures in in between. Thank you very much. Councillor Horrell, you had your hand up earlier. I don't know if your question's already been asked. Um, no, Chair, I've got a couple, if I may. Thank you. Um, coming back to Mr Baker's point, the movement strategy and um, Mr Rees, thank you for the words you've said so far. But if we um, join the CWL project and indeed what's in the SPD about um, some of the movement elements, um, we've got this particular project and also we have the new draft local plan and the very major development just up on the uh, Andover Road at Sir John Moore Barracks, major development um, of housing in this plan. Coordinating all of those alongside all the other projects that are being done by others potentially in the city is fundamental. And I'm still not clear, and I'm close to this, I'm, I'm uh, listening and attending everything, just how we're going to make sure that we bring that all to fruition. Um, I'm very proud of the movement strategy as a sort of starter for 10 on how we might uh, approach uh, movement in Winchester um, over the foreseeable future. But ensuring that we can join the dots is clearly uh, crucial and I'm, I'm just not sure what the mechanism is that we're going to use for that. That's my first question. And the second is um, the railways. Um, having approached them several years ago to come in on station approach, they weren't terribly keen at the time. Um, so I'm intrigued that, that they're at the table now and I'd welcome the opportunity to better understand what's brought them in this time um, when in fact there's less rail travel and the like going on and um, what they what is their commitment to uh, the work going forward that has so changed in the recent past sort of a build on Councillor Westwood's uh, uh, question about the changing environment thank you chair um, well thank you Councillor Horrell I, th I think to respond to your questions firstly if we deal what are the mechanisms um, for, dare I say, it's in, if I understand it correctly, ensuring that coordination and sort of like that all the pieces fit together. Um, I think it uh, goes without saying that um, we have uh, um, as within the officer sort of core, uh, uh, you know, a programme uh, for regeneration, which, um, uh, uh, you know, will in, and it will continue to ensure that we are joining those dots. But to a certain extent, the movement strategy there I say it probably is the sort of golden thread in a way uh, and we understand and, and thinking about particularly station approach um, that um, we will develop a master plan I think the key is going to be phasing you know because it's not it won't we won't get I think it's unlikely we'll get to a stage whereby everything happens at once in reality a bit like you know uh, central Winchester uh, it will be um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of implemented in phases, and uh, and you know I think the key is we need to understand what we want to achieve, but really just as importantly we'll be developing sort of phasing options, and those phasing options will let, you know be very much dependent on the ability to release. It goes without saying car parking, you know, and the ability to release car parking will be dependent on other options, you know, which are coming forward to ensure that there's sufficient capacities um, you know for parking but within the wider strategy of wishing to reduce parking generally within the city centre so you mentioned Sir John Bores more barracks and of course the northern park and ride is fairly important um, and that is part of the work which um, the parking study has been looking at and thinking about but you know the you know if uh, northern park and ride um, occurs early um, then that would enable uh, an earlier release of um, you know, potentially some of the sites. So it's going to be, I, I think, implementation phasing is going to be uh, sort of, uh, how can it, uh, incremental to a certain extent. Um, and it is around joining up all those dots. So what we're not going to be recommending or doing is sort of blithely going ahead and doing, you know, sort of not thinking about the wider Winchester position. So you end up with a development uh, you know, but that's it, you know, what's happened by just doing that, getting things built is actually we've caused a whole lot of problems, you know, in terms of movement and parking in the city. Absolutely, we're not going to be doing that. 
uh, and that is why the sort of wider consideration and understanding what the constraints are, but also the opportunities are so important. That's the first, if I had answered your first question, in terms of what brought um, Network Rail um, to the table, uh, I think there has been um, uh, strategically within Network Rail uh, um, a, a sort of a, a changing strategy. So they have been in the last couple of years increasingly looking at their assets, um, which they, or, 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 and they've been, to use that sort of cliche, I think, uh, being empowered or, or, or asked to sort of sweat the assets, to use that cliche, if I put it that way, which means that they have been looking at um, a number of station sites up and down the country, and particularly those, I think, in the southeast, um, where actually bringing forward development, um, as I said, might be beneficial to them, and I suspect help or aid in terms of the revenue, in terms of uh, uh, the, the operation of, 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 of their you know, their railways and, and um, you know, I think from our perspective, that's one again, we shouldn't forget that whilst we're looking, we're collectively looking at the capacity plan, it doesn't just cover the council sites, it covers their sites in consideration, but you know, dare I say it, you know, an important consideration for them will be actually if putting their sites in the pot, will it at the end of the day enable them to generate, you know, more revenue. Um, so um, I think that's probably, if we're honest, been the driver, um, but from our end, I think a welcome driver because you know, you know, it goes out saying that I think the station, is, you know, if we're going to get a place and regeneration, it's something which actually is going to enhance, you know, this part of Winchester. We really do, you know, need the um, network rail to be on board. Um, and it's probably also I should mention that we have um, in terms of collaboration we have a new body set up jointly with the county which is a, a growth and regeneration partnership meeting um, which up until now has been a leader to leader meeting supported by relevant officers to ensure that all aspects of what the county is doing on its capital program are joined up with what we are trying to do in terms of our regeneration redevelopment program. So while the movement strategy is the primary mechanism um, that we use to ensure this alignment between our regeneration priorities and the plans for movement within the city, and they are also inevitably phased because one of the lessons that we've learned during the entire process is there is huge contingency and dependency uh, to be able to do certain things within the centre that rely on other things having happened. Um, and uh, so on top of the work that goes on between officers and cabinet members in order to ensure that we have a joined up movement strategy that fits with everything that we're doing on regeneration, we do also have this kind of top to top method of engaging with senior directors at Hampshire um, and the leadership at Hampshire to sort of cover off any other coordination that needs to be going on in terms of ensuring that our plans fit together, not just in Winchester, but also across the entire district. Um, any other questions? Um, I don't think uh, colleagues or fellow councillors were asked to do anything other than, um, I don't think we're actually asked to do anything, but I think we should note uh, the, the contents of what we've heard and thank uh, Mrs Lyons and Mr East very much indeed for uh, their extremely helpful and comprehensive summary of where we stand on the two main projects. Um, it's greatly appreciated uh, and, and all the work that sits behind it um, is also greatly appreciated um, and, and please do also uh, um, pass on um, thanks to um, Emma Taylor who has been working on station approach and the rest of that team um, because we're very grateful for all the work that's being done um, by the colleagues that aren't here today but have enabled us to make such progress. The next item on the agenda is archaeology um, and we have a paper in front of us today colleagues um, which in essence um, is taking the necessary financial decisions um, in order to uh, go ahead with what we previously agreed with the expert archaeology panel back in July 
I think, where we had a session with um, uh, a range of very eminent archaeologists to talk about our plans. And the plans you see here today are, in essence, the ones that we agreed with them. Um, I, I mean, they are a particularly, I have to say, a particularly fascinating set of papers, and we could quite easily spend the rest of the day digging around and reading about the history of Winchester and the output of the archaeology that has happened. Well, maybe I could. I could run a one person meeting with the officers and just ask lots of questions about it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I believe we have is Tracy here. Tracy Matthews. Oh, brilliant. Um, so we do have um, our uh, expert archaeologist here um, to provide um, any professional advice that is needed. I don't know if um, anybody's going to introduce the paper. It is fairly self-explanatory. There is a lot of very rich information sitting behind it, um, but the paper itself is asking for a fairly straightforward decision, which is to fund um, the, uh, the the six trenches, and importantly, five trenches. Sorry, the five trenches. Uh, Four, four trenches. Sorry, I need to read the paper. Four, I'm losing. Yeah. Sorry about this. Four trenches. Four trenches. Um, we're being asked. We're being asked to. Um, we're being asked to approve the uh, the procurement to do the trial trenching. We're being asked for a seventy percent to thirty percent commercial valuation model. To, to have the expertise to do the work um, and uh, and also what's very clear when you read the papers is publicize uh, the work and do all the work that's necessary to bring it forward to the academic community and other um, other such uh, and to the public to approve the expenditure of three hundred and fifty thousand pounds for the work and then delegate responsibility to the strategic director um, so Sadly, we're not in a position to talk about the exciting archaeological strata in the first in Appendix A. Um, uh, or the rather fascinating history of overview of the city's history in Appendix B. Um, colleagues, do you have any questions on the paper that you would like to ask or the recommendations? Councillor Horrell. Um. Chair, a sort of comment and a question. I think um, in the preparation of the SPD, we learned the importance of archaeology and um, how valued our community um, uh, feels that this part of the project um, place, its place in the project should be. So I think um, uh, many of us welcome the opportunity to continue that learning and also the publication of that learning. It's clear that the sharing of the results is crucial in all that we do on archaeology, um, not necessarily on this project, but historically we haven't always as a council been as diligent there. And so this having this in the public domain, I think, is is crucial. Um, and therefore um, uh, also supporting uh, the quality um, a price split in terms of the procurement of this to make sure that we have uh, the appropriate quality of, uh, of consultants to support us in this effort. Um, my uh, question goes back to the sort of hint we had from yourself and, and Mrs Lyons earlier about the redevelopment of the Friarsgate site. Um, which I've been very keen to uh, see change for a long time. And um, whether you could share with us a little more um, what is in your mind in terms of maybe this work and the continuation of the archaeology work and the Friarsgate part of the site. Thank you. I can ask Mrs Lyons to uh, respond to that. I mean, I think the work is in development and as is always the way, we need to fully understand any planning implications before making any promises that we're not able to keep. Um, but Ms Lyons, do you have any comments? Yes, thank you, Lee. Thank you, Councillor Hall. The, the, through the conversations that we've been having, we have been talking to um, both, both Tracy Matthews and, and, and Patrick Ottaway. And I think on the back of the data that we're going to be getting from the trenching work that we're seeking the funding for today, Again, it's important to, to, to remind everyone that actually it will then help to inform 
the uh, proposals that come forward. We're looking to find what's down there, um, the condition that's down there, and there's very little known about the eastern side of the site um, in comparison, for example, to where the Brooks is and, 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 and there. So as we're going to be bringing down Friars Gate and looking at that site and um, through conversation we've been having, it is it is one of the first sort of phases potentially that could be developed. So if there's anything further we can do to de-risk and demystify the site with regards to what's under the ground, then I think we, we're we'd like to have a look at that. So on the back of the four trenches that we're going to be doing here on the bus station um, and 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 close locality, I think there we are now having discussions around whether there's any further work we can do in the in, in the boundary of the Friars Gate site. So it's very early days and we are just pulling together our thought process on it. And as you know, uh, Councillor Todd has said, we do need to make sure that we have a planning approach agreed, which which we are in conversations with the planning authority. But I think the idea is that we were looking at whether there is any further potential um, early investigation works on the site. I think particularly around where the slab sits and quite close to the slab, we're looking at something there. But then crucially, as part of that site, it's not just about the physical dig and the physical explorations. It's about the education, that show and tell, that bringing the community into this. Could we then link in with some of our educational establishments to maybe um, set up a, a, an experimental, you know, come and learn how to do a dig if you're studying that at university. It could be bringing the younger school students in to teach them a little bit about what it's involved. And also, you know, we, we, we've got borehole samples which we've collected. We will have a, a much clearer idea from the trenching. How can we share that more openly? So it's that little bit about physical works, but also it's about that knowledge and education for people. So I think that's what we're looking at at the moment. A little bit earlier yet to go into more detail than that. Thank you. Yes, I mean, it, it takes it from potentially a meanwhile use into something that's very firmly part of the journey forward in terms of understanding our site and helping move towards um, development. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thank you, Leader. <clears throat> and I'm really pleased actually to see this paper coming forward and to see that we are going to take the archaeology exploration a little bit further with the trenches. Um, I think Councillor Horrors has said and others will say as well that people are particularly interested in this for this site, given our rich um, um, history. I suppose the question that people will want to know, the public will still want to know, is notwithstanding the preliminary borehole work that's been done, um, notwithstanding the advice that archaeological um, artefacts are perhaps best preserved by leaving them in the ground, what would happen should we find something of considerable significance in the trench work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Well, again, I touched on it just now. The purpose of the trenching is 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 to investigate what's down there, and this is where I may have to call on 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 Tracy Matthews to advise. But the the, the data and the findings that we get from that will not then automatically lead us to do a big dig if we find something down there. I think the idea behind the trenching and behind the exploration work is to take that data and feed that into the knowledge that we have to share with our development partner to help them understand and develop the appropriate strategy for, for sort of embracing the archaeology through the planning process. So I think, Tracy, is that's that's where we're at. Yes. Yeah, I got that right. So if we do find something, there will be then those further discussions later on down the line. Once we start the development of the site, it won't lead us automatically into doing a big dig at that stage. Thank you very much indeed. And and, and for those that are interested, I recommend Appendix A, which goes into quite some detail about um, how we treat what's below the ground in the area of the development. Um, and for those who are really hardcore, I recommend going back to the uh, 2018 report right at the beginning of the process, which took a wider view as to how the Councillor Horrell's guidance as to how archaeology for the site should be managed. Um, any other questions? Um, Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, but if I, when I look at the paper in 11, 15, I think it is, we're talking about access to the site by the public and so on. Um, the, the final 
part of that little paragraph says businesses are asked to consider provision of and then there's a whole set of requirements there. I mean, I, I think it should be more than consider. I, I really want to see that happen because this is so exciting and I think we should be really encouraging people to to get involved. So I'd, I'd just like that to be a bit stronger if we could. That uh, that is it is not a consider doing it. This is something we really want to see. Uh, in that respect, and also I don't think that's a, a complete list there. I think there's scope to add more so we can put things up on our Winchester Council YouTube channel and things like this, which would be fantastic to spread this electronically further and just get people interested. So I think that's a really an exciting part that we should make sure happens and also uh, asking or seek the involvement of the students from Winchester University. We really do want those those students on board. So really major on that for me. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Westwood. There's always a problem when you refer to a paragraph 1115 that it's likely to feature somewhere in Appendix B outlining the history of the city. Um, any other questions or comments? So, well, first of all, can I thank all those involved um, uh, in the, the tremendous amount of work that's gone into the development of this paper uh, and all the work that sits behind it? I, I probably do need to thank um, was Matthews for all her work that she does to ensure that so much high quality archaeological work is done within our city as part of the development process. Um, we've heard uh, from councillors today and we hear it frequently from the public as well how important this desire to understand our history is. Uh, we are rightly I think proud of our history in this city uh, and it's exciting that we have the chance today um, to learn more about it. So Cabinet, um, we have a set of recommendations in front of us. Um, are they are you agreed to those recommendations? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we now move on to the um, governance of the Central Winchester project. As outlined earlier, we're now reaching a stage of the process where the appointment of a development partner for Central Winchester Regeneration is reaching a conclusion with the decision to be made in March, as was outlined earlier. And as part of the process going forward, we need to define the proposals for the future governance of the project. So as the paper highlights in, fr in front of you, this is not about the policy making structure for this project. That, that remains unchanged and it's as I outlined earlier at the beginning of the meeting. So the SPD and the development brief have already been agreed through council democratic processes. The development agreement, the delivery plan, the infrastructure delivery plan, the public realm delivery plan, the phase delivery plan, the planning application uh, or the decision to make a planning application and the design and financial model will be agreed either through this committee or through cabinet or full council, as will any changes to those, uh, including assignment, which was one of the things that uh, tripped us up last time with Silver Hill. So what we're here to talk about today is um, the regular review of weekly progress and representation on the project team and how that's structured and how project board meetings will ensure the delivery of agreed plans and priorities and the development of proposals to be put forward for agreement by cabinet committee uh, to this committee cabinet and full council so it's important to just confirm that the council decision making process for agreeing plans and any change to plans that was agreed by cabinet last july when this committee was set up remains in place and it gives a central role uh, to this committee. So when, for example, there's a reference in the paper uh, to the quarterly review meeting and the role of this committee in that, that is additive. That comes in addition to the responsibilities laid out earlier in the meeting and also laid out in the paper. So what this does is it adds uh, clarity about how the relationship with the developer will be managed, which is something that has not always been clear in the past. It's also clear about the decisions that will still have to be taken in public by the council or its committees. It gives councillors a formal role in the project board, something that was not in place for Silver Hill, where all direct engagement uh, and decision making with the development partner was done via officers. Um, so 
uh, and the only involvement of members was via a reference group that met in private. In addition, all the existing engagement methods remain in place, such as the archaeology advisory panel, the reference group and the open forum. And on top of that, there is an expectation as part of the development agreement uh, and, and within within the bidding process and the procurement process that there will be a very full engagement program under the development agreement um, as we move towards a full planning application. So it is very much talking about uh, not the policy that we run against in terms of how we drive this project forward, but how we ensure that that policy is implemented. Um, that's what's in front of us today. Uh, Mr. MacArthur, it's your paper. I don't know if you have any extra comments to make to that. Um, just very briefly, um, uh, thank you, Leader. Um, the paper has tried to do two things. One, at paragraph 11.3, um, explain how the framework for decision making sits because that obviously guides um, where those decisions need to be taken and hopefully that's self-explanatory and then as you've already pointed out appendix one sets out the actual governance arrangements for the project building from the day-to-day -day engagement with the project team up through quarterly reports so they're the two key elements of the report from my perspective thank you thank you very much indeed um Colleagues, fellow councillors, do you have any questions to the proposals in front of us today? Councillor Horrell. Um, Chair, thank you. And in fact, I have a number given I was going to be speaking in the councillor section. So um, maybe if I could just raise some of those which are more technical points um, initially and, and then maybe follow up um, after other councillors have have their chance. Um, throughout section 11.3, um, we in D, E, F, you refer to the council. Um, do you mean full council or one of the proposed committees when using that term? Um, in 11.3 J, you refer to a long lease being automatically granted on practical completion. Um, can you share what type of lease you intend to offer for how long and in what terms? Because that's quite a broad remit that has been allocated there. Um, my understanding is that reference groups um, involvement um, are subject to an NDA and therefore are not for public discussion. Is that again to be the case? Um, and also just so that I'm clear, where do all the, if the answer on the first question um, uh, uh, is made clear about who who is council, as it were, where do all councillors fit in the decision making for the development of central Winchester? Given this is a district project funded by all residents, I can only identify four other councillors besides cabinet who are involved in this committee, the Cabinet Regeneration Committee, who will be at the table. Is that the correct um, uh, understanding of the level of involvement outside of Cabinet? And have you discussed and rejected a broader councillor representation on the project board, given the significance of the development and the longevity of the project? And if so, why did you do that? Thank you. Mr. MacArthur. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Horrell. Um, taking the questions in turn, in relation to paragraph 11.3, where reference is made to the council, um, that is intended to uh, speak about decisions that are for uh, the, the council to take, but you know, through its normal decision making processes. So depending on the nature of the matter under consideration, it may be considered at this committee, it might be considered at full cabinet. Um, it might, if uh, the decision was taken, that it was appropriate need to be there to be referred on as a recommendation to full council. But but the reference is a generic one in terms of decisions that are being made by committees or officers under delegated authority, um, if that's been given. That's the answer in relation to that. Um, in relation to the, the um, question in relation to paragraph, 
Um, Jay, I think the answer, but I mean, I'll look to um, perhaps uh, um, Mrs. Lyons to help me with in relation to this, is that the whole question about the lease um, and the, the long lease arrangements is one of those matters that will end up being worked through with the development partner. Um, you know, so at this point, um, the, the, the concept of it being a long lease is the uh, it's been established, but the detail, much of the detail needs to be worked through with the development partner. And I think that's how we're envisaging things. Um, th thank you. I see that Mrs. Lyons is indicating that she agrees with that answer, which is uh, comforting. Um, uh, in relation to the, the reference group and um, NDAs, um, I think the whole the, the whole question about how we uh, share uh, confidential information with with people um, is something that we need to consider. So certainly in relation to, to um, uh, people who are not councillors and therefore not covered by the councillor code of conduct, um, we are giving thought to that, and it may very well be that it's appropriate for. Um, for some of that material to be shared under the context of an NDA. But I think once again, it's 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 difficult to judge in, in abstract when that would be the case, because there's a, obviously there's a whole question about whether this is really commercially sensitive and how that would be worked through is once again a matter that you would expect the project team to be talking to the development partner about um, because uh, we all want and they want as much transparency as possible, but obviously that's not the same as a completely open book uh, arrangement. Um, I think I've possibly answered the question about decision making through this committee and what is for full council, because I think uh, the intention is that decisions will be taken you know, appropriately within the delegated authority given and therefore um, w w without wishing to fetter anybody's discretion going forward, I, I think everyone envisages that it's probably uh, that likely to be this committee that will do a lot of the heavy lifting and um, with more major uh, decisions that commit uh, the, the council to activity being taken either through cabinet or, as I say, escalated uh, where appropriate through to full council. Um, and the question of the project board membership, I'm not sure is a, uh, a question for, for me. So if I might pass that to Mrs. Mrs. Lyons, do you want to respond to that? Yes, thank you. Councillor Horrell, the issue around the project board, I think we, we need to have a proportionate representation from our, both parties. So I think from the um, the developer, <laughs> yes, yes. So, so no, the developer, sorry, both both the development partner and the council. So I think where we where we were trying to, to get to the balance is that um, sort of four representatives from Winchester City Council and four representatives from the development partner would, would form the project board. And I think we're also trying to make sure that the, the project progresses and getting the balance right between the governance and the monitoring and the obligations to give as much information as we possibly can, but without fettering the development and the progress of the project. So that's where the the sort of two two members of the executive leadership team, two members of um, our elected members will sit on that project board. That then is 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 quite an even split between the development partner and the the council. Sorry to scare you then. Thank you very much indeed for that clarification. Um, so I suppose effectively just to sort of so we can explore this issue a bit more. We're saying today we're not talking about constitutional changes. We're not talking about changes in the way that the council makes decisions. So where there's a reference to the council in a generic sense, it will still operate under the scheme of decision making that we have agreed for this committee for cabinet and for full council with the proviso that this committee can always bump things up if it thinks it's relevant. But I think the expectation is that this will be the body that does the heavy lifting um, in terms of scrutinising progress on the project through um, the, court, the regular reports to this committee um, uh, and also most of certainly putting in place all the building blocks that are needed um, for all major decisions. Um, are there any other questions? 
Yes, Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Leader. Um, just one question on risk. Um, and having run major um, IT development projects before now, the risk register is key to uh, keeping control over this project and, and understanding points of uh, stress and potential failure. So risk is in here, as mentioned, but I don't see any detail of where and how that risk register, and perhaps this is the wrong paper at this, this particular point, but um, the risk uh, register needs to be maintained at quite a low level with the work streams, project teams, um, and then assessed at the, um, uh, the project team meeting, project board meetings. So I think there's a bit more that we ought to be um, elaborating on risk and where risk is uh, captured and managed and dealt with. Uh, throughout the governance process. Um, I'm seeing it as a kind of Mexican standoff between Mr. McCarthy yeah, and Mrs. So, Lyons. Um, if I may draw first then. Um, thank you, Lee, and uh, thank you, Councillor Westwood. Um, the whole question of risk um, is obviously a very important one, and the, um, as you'd imagine, the project team have risk registers that um, each work stream is, will be running risk registers, the re risk registers will be pulled together. So the references here are about, you know, when the output of all that work, when it's been built up, will be will be scrutinized. Um, but just to reassure that the, there is already a risk register, um, it is used um, uh, extensively and the expectation will be that the work streams as they develop will have their own and that will be, um, as I say, pulled together in a sort of project wide uh, risk register. So um, references here, I wouldn't want to give the impression that there was a, a, a minimal focus on risk. Quite the opposite is uh, is the case. Thank you. I will just add in there, sorry, Leader, to, to come on to that. Part of the evaluation was the development partners and the bidders approach to risk and how they manage that. So again, very much up front and centre through the whole procurement process, and that will be carried through as, as Mr. We, we do have a risk register. It will be published alongside the cabinet papers for, and scrutiny. So, um, and that will then, the two will will, will work together to make sure that that, that that's scrutinised and mitigated. I understand correctly in the paper in um, uh, where are we? Section ten one. Um, it makes it clear that it will be publicly reported, the status of the risk register, while also making clear that it's an important matter for the project board. And um, those of you like me uh, have reread the Claire Lloyd Jones report more often than maybe I should have done, will know that the lack of an adequate risk register um, was one of the many issues with that scheme. Um, Councillor Lurney. Uh, thank you. Um, clearly the paper here in front of us today is dealing with the formal governance arrangement, so it's around decision making. Um, however, as um, Mr Devoy's um, appearance today has made clear, um, this, this formal decision making environment is not necessarily the best one for the public to ask questions um, and hear you know, more informally what's going on. Um, can you tell us what's going to be happening about the Central Winchester Forum? Yes, I mean, I think the intention is that the Central Winchester Forum continues, um, although it will be sitting alongside what we expect to be a major engagement and listening program from the developer. Um, and uh, I'm mildly tempted to see if we look at the standing orders and allow public questions at this meeting. But anyway, um, uh, Mrs Lyons, you have further comments? Yeah, I was just going to say, ab absolutely, the, the, the open forum will be um, a regular occurrence as it has been. It will work alongside and complement what is done here at the Regeneration Committee. So it'll be in the format that we've done before, either virtually or, or in person. And there will also be, as, as Councillor Todd has said, and has been part of the conversations right the way through the procurement process, the expectation of the uh, development partner and actually the, all, all of the bidders that we've spoken to and particularly the, 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 the preferred partner, community, uh, communication engagement is absolutely top of their agenda. They absolutely do understand and want to be part of the community and want to engage and want to get this going. So there will be plenty of opportunity 
away from the formal setting and the formal structure for people to become engaged and involved. That's great to hear. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Ferguson. <clears throat> um, thank you, Lita. And if I could just follow up on, on that point, um, Ms. Lyons. So the um, communication and engagement strategy, am I right in thinking that that will come back to this committee? Thank you. Yes, that's correct. That'll be one of the first things that we do after this sort of official appointment and standstill period, sitting down, looking at the engagement strategies, looking up at setting up the governance arrangements and, and getting firmer details on, on timings. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Oh, Councillor Horrell, far away. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, for clarity, I think it would be helpful if the um, open forum was referred to in the wider engagement piece. There's been a question today about where it sits. It's not clear from the paper, from the appendix, um, that it is going to continue and uh, that it'll sit alongside other activities. I think that would just be helpful to everyone to understand it. It continues, Chair, just a, 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 a thought. Um, could we also just clarify, is the archaeology, archaeology advisory panel that's also referenced, is that the one that was formed before the continuation of that expert panel across a multitude of disciplines? Just to, to clarify, because it's not, again, clear here, um, the representation on, on that. Um, so it would just be helpful to understand, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think is the answer. And I would, I think I agree. Uh, there was a version of the paper, I think, with some confused uh, communication in finalising it. Um, so paragraph 220, there was a C which referred to the CWR open forum. It referred to other things as well, and the other things needed to be removed. But um, the open forum, I think, should still be in there. So uh, not entirely sure what process I need to do, but um, at, I would suggest that when we come to approve this appendix um, that we retrospectively add in a reference to the open forum as 220C. So thank you for um, making that clear. Um, so, um, uh, colleagues, do we have any debate about this paper? Thank you very much indeed for a very useful set of questions and I think it I think it has probably clarified. Sorry, Caroline. Sorry, Councillor. Um, Chair, Chair, sorry, I do. Um, this paper doesn't sit well with me, and it doesn't sit well with me because the opportunity for the broader engagement and the open conversations that we benefited from when we had the development of the SPD, having had the sadness of Silver Hill, we learned to work together again uh, as councillors, as the public, as interested groups, and we came together across party um, and made the SPD, and that's a key building block in this. And what I worry about when I read this is that the majority of meetings are in private, so the minutes will be subject to an FOI, but they won't be more generally available. Um, there will be some reporting mechanisms to this committee and we've already seen this morning the sort of broader desire to to have a conversation about some of this so my question back to you uh, uh councillor todd and, and and the and the cabinet members is can we do anything else just to make sure that this process as we go forward is as inclusive as possible that people get the chance to participate so that when we come to the conclusions, people feel that it's a fair position. And that's what happened with the SPD. Everyone had their chance to participate. And I hope we got a fair representation of everyone's points. And, and again here, I think we just need to make sure that in the, in the commercialization process, which I accept entirely, having been in business, I, I know you don't want to reveal your hand entirely, but the, the desire for that full participation, and that may be dependent, uh, Chair, on the development partners approach, which we don't yet know, obviously, until that's revealed. But I just share with you 
um, we learnt a lot in the past and it's just building on that learning and make sure, making sure at this next stage we don't close in whether we still give everyone the chance to um, uh, be informed but also to participate and ask questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Horrell. Um, does anybody else have want to say anything in debate? Oh, um, Ms Lyons, you have a you have a a, co a comment. I I just wanted to come come back to you, Councillor Horrell, just to reassure you that that is very much part of what will form the communication engagement strategies that we agree and 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 also review agree um, with the development partner. So have rest assured it is is something very much that we're aware of and will be brought back and discussed and that will be part of their ongoing communications. Thank you. Um, Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Leader. Yes, yeah, so can I just step my voice of support to that as well? So sitting as a backbencher in this organisation, um, but part of this committee, then I think it's important that uh, as many people as possible across all members in, in the council are, are kept informed as much as possible through this entire process. So, you know, I'm very happy um, that uh, Councillor Hall raised it and I'm very happy that uh, Mrs Lyons has said that this is the intent to go forward. So, you know, with that respect, I, 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 it sits a little more easily with me if that's the uh, spirit in which we're doing it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lerney. Uh, thank you. Um, certainly, I think that it's really important that we make that commitment to that openness and broader engagement as far as we can within, as Councillor Horrell mentioned, the need to be operate within a commercial environment. Um, I think one thing I would say is that for those of us who were involved in the process, uh, particularly when we were looking at setting up the scores by which we were going to assess development partners, that approach to engagement and public involvement was a very important part of that scoring process. And indeed, that was um, increased um, from the initially proposed um, figures. So it has been important right through the process. And certainly, um, as a member of Cabinet, I can say that I'm personally committed to making sure that we stay as open as possible and that we hold our development partner to those principles and to the commitments they've made through the process. Thank you very much indeed. Any other comments? Um, so, like Councillor Horrell, I share the importance of public openness and engagement. If I think back to the SPD process, the kind of engagement you're talking about is the kind of engagement that we are expecting from the development partner and that is how it fits into the process that is something that we will be expecting from them that is something that this committee will discuss and agree um, prior to implementation so there is no question as to the importance of that openness but i think it's i think the clarification that we need to make was that the public were not decision makers when it came to the governance of the spd that was a decision that was taken through scrutiny, cabinet and full council. And it was taken by councillors and in the same way as would happen now on any decision, people had their chance to make deputations to that meeting, but it was part of the council's formal governance progress process. So I think it's important that we don't treat what we're planning to do as different from what was done with the SPD. In the same way, that we will require and expect an open, imaginative, inclusive approach to the next stage of development and the finalising of the, of the outline planning application, the detailed planning application, all the work that goes forward towards the next stages of decision making in the same way as we will expect full involvement and popular people's participation in that process. Um, uh, yeah, we will be we will be expecting that we have set that expectation. We have scored the bidders on the strength of their plans and that or rather officers have scored the bidders and the strength of their plans for those proposals. And it is absolutely baked into how things um, will be working ongoing. That's not what this paper is about. This paper is about um, uh, the government confirms that we maintain the democratic governance 
that we had for the SPD, that we've had for all other major projects in the same way as we have done in the past. And actually, in terms of the project management, provides more clarity and give councillors a bigger role than we have ever had before on this kind of project. As far as I'm aware from reading um, the Claire Lloyd-Jones report, there were no councillors on the equivalent of the project board for Silver Hill at all. Um, there was a reference group which had no decision making role uh, and also met in private, but there were one of the criticisms of Silver Hill was that there was no councillor involvement at all. Um, and I think it is an improvement uh, and believe I think it's actually more council involvement than we had on the equivalent committee for the leisure centre um, and also for Silver Hill. Um, so the main body that will be holding the development developer to account, the development partner to account will be this committee, which will meet in public. Um, but as you know, from other major projects, there are meetings which are held in private where um, perhaps more candor is possible than might be possible, might be easy to have in a public meeting. Um, and that is common practice for project management. And it is part of a spectrum of the ways in which we will engage with a development partner. But the bits that matter are firstly, that public engagement in the develop, development of any proposals is absolutely at the heart of what we expect from them as a development partner. Uh, and the public role of this committee in terms of managing this and other major major redevelopments remains undimmed and unaffected by the decision that we have in front of us today. Um, so we have recommendations in front of us and we're recommended to approve the governance framework set out in Appendix 1 with the addition of the extra paragraph that I made reference to so that we explicitly reference the open forum. Uh, and we're asked to delegate to the strategic director with responsibility for the central Winchester regeneration project uh, to incorporate the key principles and mechanisms set out in these proposals into the development agreement with the selected development partner subject to any minor clarification or fine tuning agreed with the development partner. Um, colleagues, are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And I believe that is uh, all the business we have in front of us today. Um, can I thank officers for the preparatory work that you've done to bring us to this meeting? Um, particularly, I think we found the introduction of the timeline, the state of the project and the process and the chance to interrogate that very valuable, but also the chance to decide on these more specific proposals and have the cross party um, interrogation backbench interrogation, cabinet interrogation of the proposals that this committee was intended to facilitate. Finally, I will thank Councillor Horrell for stepping in at the last minute and filling in for her, her colleagues, um, which I'm sure we can all agree she did more than adequately, and it's much appreciated uh, for you doing that at so little notice. So um, thank you also to the members of the public for coming forward uh, and making your deputations. Uh, Mr Devoy, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please feel free to do so. Um, but I declare um, the meeting closed. Thank you.